Fred. She liked banyan trees the best. They weren't as common as coconut trees, but were far more beautiful, with twisted trunks and veils of dangling hair connecting to the roots. There were enough of them to enjoy on the tropical island of Hainan, in China's far south. Over water, from the megalopolis of the Pearl River Delta, the island province is right at the bottom of the map, hanging underneath the peninsula west of Hong Kong, as if China had dripped it out. Not counting a spray of contested rocks in the South China Sea, it is the most southernmost part of the People's Republic, politically part of the mainland, geographically not. The south of China can feel like a different country entirely from the north. Wheat fields give way to rice paddies cut into the hillside, and arid yellow land gradates to green. The people are often built smaller and speak Cantonese or a variety of dialects that are incomprehensible to those in the north, who mostly speak Mandarin. Differences in personality can be summed up by their respective cuisines. Northerners quick-fry their meat and speak just as directly, with a roughness that is sometimes only skin deep. Southerners braise, boil and stew, but a soft exterior can hide subtle and sharp flavours. Hainan itself is in the same latitude as the Caribbean. The temperature in mid-December averages 20 degrees Celsius and summers get up to 40. There are sandy beaches, palm and lychee and banana trees, mangoes and passion fruit and mangosteens. In the resort town of Sanya, there is snorkelling, surfing, banana boating and jet skiing, while tourists from all over China, especially the frigid northeast, paddle in the ocean wearing beach pyjamas and plastic face keenies. If you're lucky, you'll see a golden monkey in the lush central mountains. If you're unlucky, a snake will fall onto you off a tree. Hugging the northern shore, a ferry ride away from the continent, is the island's capital, Haiku. The name literally means Mouth of the Sea, but its nickname is Coconut City. You can buy a coconut at any convenience store to hack open and drink with a straw. Spindly coconut trees line the streets, and only occasionally someone is killed by a falling package. Inside a gated residential community to the east of town, one such tree juts out over the road at 45 degrees like a raised traffic barrier. Further in is a rock garden with a miniature waterfall and sandy park. The buildings have pillar-strutted balconies in the European style, an architectural import thanks to returned migrants from former British colonies in Malaysia. The girl who grew up in this luxurious setting didn't lack for anything. A live-in maid cleaned her room, laundered her clothes and cooked her meals. When she needed to shuttle around town or go to school, the family driver took her in their Mitsubishi. An only child, no expense was spared on her comfort and her education, and she enjoyed the best of everything. There is a name for these sons and daughters of rich Chinese who live gilded lives. Fu Adai, the rich second generation. She was in a closely related tribe, Guan Adai, the party second generation, offspring of government officials. There are tens of millions of Communist Party officials in China of various ranks, including those who make up its Leviathan bureaucracy. Her father had been in the machine for decades, at first in a human resources department and later rising higher, his job title and family name are undisclosed here to protect his identity. Like all officials, his salary was nominally small, but the position came with a flat, a car and other perks. Her mother, also a Communist Party member, was a professor in one of the party schools, where officials were versed in their ABCs of communist ideology and governance. When she was nine, her father travelled to Guangzhou, the nearest metropolis, to buy her a Chinese-made grand piano. She practised one hour every day. On top of her homework, reading time and chess practice, it was just another routine in a childhood overscheduled by ambitious parents. There may be no tigers in Hainan, but there are always tiger mothers. 
Playing the piano was her favourite chore, especially Frederick Chopin and Franz Schubert. She combined their two first names to make her own English name, Frederans, and shortened it to Fred. Fred was that kind of a student. Top of her class, first with the answer, perfect essays in neat small characters hugging the line. In her spare time, she read Pride and Prejudice, Jane Eyre and A Tale of Two Cities in translation, alongside the four Chinese classics. Of those, she liked Dream of the Red Chamber best, especially the descriptions of intrigue and backstabbing within a noble family. Meanwhile, the library at home was lined with more stolid fare, quotations of Mao Zedong in thick red volumes next to revolutionary biographies, but also foreign political philosophy and translation from her mother's collection, including Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. Politics class was the worst. Patriotic Education, a campaign launched in 1991 in reaction to the Tiananmen protests, is compulsory for all Chinese students. From middle school to the end of university, each student tots up almost a thousand hours of it. Fred sat through two classes a week, each of the 50 minutes dragging endlessly. Modules included Mao Zedong political thought, Deng Xiaoping economic theory, and Zhang Zemin's Three Represents. The dominant historical narrative was that the communists liberated China after a century of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers. Whether the purpose is to drill political consciousness deeper or bore the class out of having one at all is unsure. Fred preferred to stare out of the fifth floor window at the coconuts dangling outside. Hers was the best school in Haiku, with marble-floored halls and lofty buildings. There is a statue of Confucius inside the front gate, but the party is everywhere else. Set onto plinths around campus are varnished stone busts of Marx, Engels and Lenin. Fred and her friends put jumpers and scarves on them as a prank to the infuriation of the head teacher. Fred was asked to be a class monitor, overseeing her fellow students, but felt it was a sham and abdicated power after a week to better focus on study. The one time she got 77 out of 100 on the politics test, her mum was livid. Fred got her real political education at home, the inside story on how the Communist Party actually worked. While her father was in the Human Resources Department, he had seen how local officials won their positions. His favourite complaint over dinner was that top officials got the job through connections, not merit. Networks of patronage and mutual back-scratching, cemented by gift-giving and male bonding over banquets, came with the territory. If you didn't have a liver of steel to cope with all of the hard liquor toasts, you were in the wrong line of work. He learnt to play that game himself as he rose higher in the ranks, hosting other officials in high-end restaurants and being hosted in turn. They ate, they ate bird's nest soup, sea cucumber and other delicacies, learning to love the expense account. Fred wasn't invited to those feasts, but often accompanied her parents on house visits. There she saw large jade ornaments, marble interiors, a gold watch here, designer specs there, mention of a child in a prestigious university overseas, all clues to a lifestyle that didn't match the official salary. Businessmen constantly courted her father for favours. Fred remembers one time when a local property developer, angling after a contract, dropped off a hamper of fruit at their home and left. Later, her father found a large jade bracelet buried in the bottom, the most expensive variety worth tens of thousands of won. He invited the developer back and returned the bracelet. At spring festival, Fred's red envelopes were always stuffed with extra lucky money, sometimes over a thousand in each. One of her father's duties after his promotion was touring local villages whenever they held an election. Village elections were introduced in China in the 80s on a small scale, but by the millennium they were widespread. The contested position was that of village chief, a separate and arguably less important role to that of party chief, who was appointed by a less participatory process. 
Elections gave the village chief legitimacy, fixing a thorny problem of rural governance, but they were also a fledgling experiment in democracy at the level with the lowest stakes. By many measures, it was a failed experiment. Villages were less educated and elections often devolved into tribal affairs where groups voted for the candidate who shared their surname. Just as common was for a candidate to buy votes to buy votes outright. Some looked to the party chief to tell them who to vote for, and at other times it was the party chief who ran for village chief as well. The result was regularly contested, sometimes involving riots. After the first kerfuffle, Fred's father always went with two police officers, and his function was to anoint the winner with official Communist Party approval, which, some might say, defeats the purpose. Fred had learned all about democracy in school. It wasn't a dirty word. China's supreme leaders used it all the time, in speeches, even held it up as a national value. But it was always democracy with a lowercase d, a vague sense of popular agency, serving the people, but nothing as specific or taboo as multi-party national elections. The very word in Chinese is barely more than a century old. Minshu, the characters for people and rule originally combined in Japanese and imported to China later. The literal translation is rule by the people, but official use makes it sound more like rule for the people. Put into elective practice, Fred only heard from her father how it fell short of the mark. History was another topic at the dinner table. Fred's parents were keen that she knew the true story of China, not the version she got in school. Secure in their official status, they told her about starvation and ideological madness during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Tiananmen they glossed over, but even what they did say was exceptional. For most of the post-80s generation, their parents don't tell them about China's recent past. Why burden your child with that knowledge when it might not be safe for them to know it? One family story that struck home was how her grandfather, an official in the education ministry in the 60s, was sent for six years of reform by Labour on a dam in Hainan's mountains when the political tides turned against him. He was rehabilitated years later after humiliations including Yin Yang Head, where half of his hair was shaved off, while Red Guard teenagers threw rocks at his son, Fred's dad. Fred couldn't reconcile that story with the bent but smiling man she knew as Grandad any more than she could the tales of people eating bark to survive back then with the life of plenty around her, or the fact that her father was working for the same party that had stoned him. It felt more like fairy tale than history. Those times were gone, and for Fred's parents what mattered was building a good life for the next generation. In that respect, officialdom was the smart choice, the proverbial iron rice bowl that guaranteed a good living, except this bowl was gilded. For all the party's past crimes, it still held China together, was the common line of thinking. It was possible to live with that cognitive dissonance, while the centre of power was 2,000 kilometres away in Beijing. The mountains are tall, the emperor is far away, went the old proverb, and mountainous Hainan was as distant as it got. It was a pleasant corner of China to call home. Islanders, like Fred's family, who were ethnically Han but had come to Hainan generations ago, prided themselves on a leisurely attitude to life. There were long afternoons, filled by tea drinking, mahjong marathons, and meals of dim sum, or fresh seafood, while shooting the ocean breeze. Building golf courses has been illegal in China since the early 2000s, a capitalist excess, but Hainan has over 20. Develop developers call them nature resorts. At the weekends, and on holidays, Fred's parents took her into the central mountains, where they had a second home. She read, caught fish in the creeks, and played with the indigenous minority kids. 
that she was always back in time for the family ritual of watching the national news at 7pm, a mind-nubbing, state-controlled programme broadcast simultaneously into homes all over China. She knew she would leave Hainan eventually. There was a whole nation above her. But when she was hidden in those hills, she didn't want to know it.